Yes.
we had a problem with the children's movement. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. I have a question for everyone today. Where is Jesus? Well, I'll tell you something. This week, I had a really great week. This week, I saw, I see, I think I see Jesus everywhere, right? When I talk to you about that, one, today, this last week on Thursday, um, it just so happened I was here for communion at the same time as one of our church friends, and we pulled into the parking lot to take our communion in our car at the same time, and we were able to look over at each other and smile and we rode down our windows and visited for a minute, and I saw Jesus in her face. She was happy, and I was happy. We were glad to see each other. And then again, later this week, a friend told me a story. She needed something for her bicycle to be able to help the children that she cares for. And she had looked for this um, item. She looked online. She just didn't know what she was going to do. And out of the blue, a stranger contacted one of her relatives and said, I've got this thing that goes on a bicycle for carrying children, and I don't need it anymore. And she was just, all of a sudden, she had what she needed. So there was Jesus working again. He, he works in our lives in all kinds of ways, boys and girls. I'm going to read a story to you today, so I hope you enjoy this. And the name of it is... Where is Jesus? Cindy said her goodnight prayer. Be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask you to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. But sometimes Cindy wondered, where is Jesus? Is he really near me? When my friends came to my birthday party, did Jesus come too? Jesus says, I remember every day of your life. Psalms 139, 16. If I fight with my brother, does Jesus leave me? Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. Did he see me on the ride at the fair? Jesus says, every moment I see where you are. Psalms 139.3 When I was sick, did Jesus watch over me? Jesus says, I help you when you are sick, and I care for your hurts and worries. Psalms 41.3 If I go far away, does he come with me? Jesus says, wherever you go, high in the sky or deep in the ocean, I will be there. Psalms 139, 8 through 10. When I'm trying something new, does he help me? Jesus says, do not be afraid. I am here to help you. Isaiah 41, 13. Is Jesus with me when it's dark and scary? Jesus says, even the darkness can't keep me away. Psalms 139, 12. When I've made my friend sad, is Jesus there? Jesus says, I come near you to help you when you are feeling sad. Psalms 34, 18. Cindy smiled and snuggled into her bed. As she drifted off to sleep, she prayed, I'm glad you are always with me, Jesus. Amen. Jesus says, I saw you even before you were born. I watch and protect you each day. All through the night, I am with you. And when you wake in the morning, I will be here beside you. That's from Psalms 139. Boys and girls, I hope you remember that Jesus is, is everywhere and always with you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, 
We thank you so very much for your wonderful watch care. We thank you that you are with us in times of trouble, happiness, when we're feeling sick or frightened, and that all we need to do is remember that you are right there beside us. We thank you for that. Thank you for everything. Help us to remember to always look to you when we need you and to just know that you are with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus was a little children, all oh, the children of the world, ran and never brought me right there, precious and the sun. Jesus was a little children of the world. Our scripture today is found in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Demias, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. May God add his blessings to the reading and hearing of his most holy word. Easter. In the church, Easter is not a day, it's a season, lasting about seven weeks until Pentecost. I'm really hoping to be worshiping with you in person by the end of the season. Of course, we'll worship regardless because celebration is what Easter is all about. Christ is risen! He is, he is risen, risen indeed! indeed. <laughs> but as regards our message for today, it was Sunday evening. Christ had indeed risen, and ten of the eleven apostles knew that he had risen because he'd appeared to them there in the locked room where they had gathered. All but Thomas had the opportunity the very night of the resurrection to see and touch and talk to the very real Jesus. But for some reason, Thomas wasn't there. We don't know why. Maybe he was the only one brave enough to go out for food. Or maybe to find out what the authorities were doing. But at any rate, Thomas wasn't there. And when he came back, he was understandably frustrated. He had been left out. Maybe he thought the others were getting back at him for suggesting that they come to Judea in the first place. He had, you know 
when it was clear that Jesus was coming to mourn Lazarus' death, Thomas had said, let us go too, so that we may die with him. Now that looked just a little too prophetic. At any rate, Thomas was tired, scared, frustrated, and more than a little suspicious of the others telling him that Jesus had been there in the flesh. It wasn't funny, he may have thought. So he lashed out. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Not cannot, will not. In other words, you're not going to fool me, so just shut up about it. He just hadn't had the proof of his senses as the others had. Remember, they'd seen Jesus. Thomas had not. Thomas had a whole week to stew about this or to feel hurt. I don't think it even occurred to him that the others could be telling the truth. It was probably a very long week because everybody but him was optimistic and excited. He must have thought they were mad. But next Sunday, he was in the house with them with the doors shut when Jesus suddenly stood among them once again. He said, peace be with you. And then he turned immediately to Thomas. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Now, notice the gospel doesn't say that Thomas actually did either of those two things. Instead, he answered, my Lord and my God. Seeing was believing. And Jesus remarked on that. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And who exactly would that be? Exactly no one. As far as the Gospels report, there was not at this point even one person who believed in the resurrection without having seen the resurrected Christ. So, who is he talking about? You guessed it. He was talking about us. We are blessed because we believe without having seen. And we are blessed. For one thing, there's a large body of research which shows that people who are more religious and spiritual have better health than those who aren't. We have better mental health, less risk of disease, and better response to treatment. Just anecdotally, I've observed during our social distancing period here that people who are dedicated Christians, not just Christians in name, but those deeply devoted to Christ, are much more optimistic, stress less, and talk more about hope. They're less frustrated and thus less likely to ignore social distancing guidelines and other safety concerns. They're more considerate of others. Why would this be? I think it's because they believe that no matter what happens, God's got this. They believe and they're blessed. Jesus wasn't criticizing Thomas when he noted that he believed mainly because he had seen. The other apostles were in exactly that same boat. But he truly hit on something when he said that those who believe without seeing would be blessed. We are in so many ways. Maybe because since we don't see Jesus, we have to rely on other senses spiritual senses, senses that go deep to the heart of who we are. One of the hallmarks of Methodism is its emphasis on what it calls experience. We're not talking about experience of the world here, but rather experience of Jesus and God 
as conveyed by the Holy Spirit. He had to rely, Thomas couldn't rely on this kind of experience yet. He hadn't received the Spirit. He had to rely on his eyes. But Jesus presumably breathed on him as he had on the others, maybe when he said, do not doubt but believe. And Thomas suddenly woke up from his cynicism and woke up to the reality of the risen Christ. How do we get that kind of awakening? Well, first we must receive the Holy Spirit. Most of us have at our baptisms, but in many people the experience is dormant or forgotten. Overwhelmed by rational data and physical experience that seems more real than our spiritual experience. Maybe we in the church make it harder by baptizing infants who then don't remember receiving the Spirit. So what can we do? Thomas gives us a hint. Remember he said, I will not believe rather than I cannot believe. Though ultimately it's a gift from God, belief starts with an act of will. Most of the time, if a person decides they're not going to believe in Jesus, they're not going to believe. Occasionally that's overturned. For example, think of Saul of Tarsus, who became St. Paul. But most of the time, the lack of will to believe works as spiritual blinders. I think I've mentioned before that I was a drama major. No, not a drama queen, a drama <laughs> major. There is a thing in the theater that we must always have in an audience to be successful. It's called willing suspension of disbelief. Apparently, disbelief is our natural state, and when we watch a play or movie or read any kind of fiction, we have to willingly ignore that disbelief. Otherwise, we could never enjoy a movie like Star Wars because we'd be constantly thinking things like, why did Carrie Fisher let them put donuts on her head? <laughs> or, you can't hear explosions in space. We wouldn't be able to enjoy it. But in order to enter the world of Princess Leia and the Force, we willingly agree that for a time, we will believe. Now, I'm not comparing Jesus to Luke Skywalker, though there actually have been some theses on that theme. But the principle of belief is the same. Our natural tendency, like Thomas, is to disbelieve. We must actively suspend that disbelief in order to be open to new beliefs. We have to want to believe. Once we open ourselves up to the possibility, the Holy Spirit can work in us to let us experience spiritual truths, like the resurrection. Do you believe in the resurrection? Of course you do. But have you ever tried to convince someone who didn't? Not so easy. They have to want to believe. Once we believe, though, a whole new world of spiritual comfort and hope opens up to us because the Spirit is with us. We can open our arms to God and physically feel His presence. That's what gives us hope. Hope in dire straits. Hope in the midst of trouble. Hope in the midst of a pandemic. Because even when we're socially isolated, we are not alone. God is with us. The Holy Spirit is our friend, our comforter, our ever-present help in trouble. Because we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, we can also believe he sent the Spirit to be those things for us. Thomas had to see to believe. We have to willingly believe in order that we can see. 
we do come to believe and we're richly rewarded with hope, love, power, and all the gifts of the Spirit. As Jesus said, we are blessed. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we want to believe. We want to see the risen Christ with our hearts, if not with our eyes. We want to welcome you, our companion, who keeps us one with the Father and the Son. Bring us the light in the darkness that comes from knowing Jesus and from knowing you. Keep our eyes fixed on your future, a future of renewed vision and communion with Christ, a future of good for all who love the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. We believe and we are blessed. Now's the time for our morning prayer. If you would, bow with me once again. God of new beginnings, you raised Jesus from the grave so that we too might experience life eternal. Thank you, Lord, and bless your holy name. We are not worthy of your love, but you inspire in us belief and faith, and you raise us up to life. Thank you, dear Lord, for your spirit, for your word, for your love, and for your mercy. Thank you that we are weathering the storm of the coronavirus and teach us of our indebtedness to you. Your creation on earth is so beautiful in the springtime. You could have made things useful without making them beautiful, but you share their great beauty and brightness with us. Thank you for so loving us. We ask you to be with the poor, dear Lord. This disease reaches and kills the poor disproportionately because of the places and ways they have to live and the jobs they have to take. Help us to right these wrongs and protect your children when they cannot protect themselves. Lord, lead those who don't know Jesus to appropriate websites and YouTube videos as they abound in this season. And let us never tire of carrying your words of hope and love to them. Please be with our nation and her leaders as they strive to keep us all safe. And give them wisdom as they move ahead into the future. Lord, be with the church your body on earth, and help it to prosper. We're entering a time of financial hardship and low attendance. There are many, dear Lord, who we have on our hearts. Let us take a moment of silence to raise them up to you. Be with all who are affected by the virus. Your presence and your will are our comfort and our stay. Be also with the children of the world, the victims of natural disasters, and the victims of violence wherever they are. All these things we pray along with the unspoken needs of our hearts, and we pray these words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of As I mentioned earlier, it's still Easter for the next six weeks. My daughter, when she was little, used to keep me hiding Easter eggs for most of that time. I didn't keep putting candy in them. She wasn't as much interested in the candy as she was in the hiding and finding. The discovery. That's part of our celebration of Easter, too. It's not just waking up on a beautiful spring day to the knowledge that Jesus is alive. 
It's every day after that for the rest of our lives, letting that knowledge sink in and living up to the hope it gives us. That hope is living and imperishable. In spite of everything, we have much to be glad about. We can share that gladness through generosity. So once again, we're reminding you to mail in your tithes and many thanks to those of you who have been doing so regularly. Thank you. Amen. Blessed be.